So I uh, was in the seminary in Rome for a couple of years and I remember talking to some of the uh, Irish seminarians uh, who were there in the Irish college. And one of them said, I had the strangest experience over the weekend. And I said, go on, what happened? And he said, I was down in the uh, kind of the gym that they have. They have a gym there in the Irish college. So he's down there in the gym uh, doing, his, doing his thing. And this, this guy walks in, he's there in his white t-shirt and his, and his shorts, and uh, he's on the treadmill for a bit, you know what I mean? And then afterwards, uh, this, this guy with a nice smelling cologne comes over to him and says, um, pleased to meet you. Uh, what's your name? And he says, I'm Paddy. Uh, and then the, the other guy says, uh, I'm Tony. Tony Blair. <laughs> Tony Blair, had just, he was staying in the Irish College and had just come down to use the gym there in the Irish College. And the guy was there running beside him, sweating, like grunting, doing whatever else, and had no idea that this was Tony. Uh, would you, you recognise him in a shirt? Well, you probably would. But in a shirt and shorts, or well, sorry, in a T-shirt and shorts, uh, there was, he realised afterwards there were security guards, two guys with, black, with dark shades with their hands in their pockets somewhat anonymously <laughs> outside the gym during the whole event, and he didn't know it. So you can be looking at someone quite well known and not know them, not know who they are. It's very interesting when, when we meet people, we really have no idea what's going on uh, behind the scenes. You really have no idea what's going on behind closed doors. Uh, you have no idea what goes on in a person's heart. You really have no idea. It's, it's, it's very interesting because we're, we're, good, we're good at masking it. Um, modern cosmetics have made that even easier. You know, you can just plaster it all up and you can even get one of these kind of Botox jobby things that makes it look like you have a constant smile on your face. <laughs> so you walk around and you look constantly happy. Your face is just stuck, pause on smile, you know? Very strange. Uh, so, but it makes you look happy, okay? So again, like, it's just really hard to see what's going on in a person's heart. What's going on behind the scenes? In, in today's gospel, I, I, I love picking out the details of the gospel because sometimes the, go the details are really, really, really important. Okay, so Jesus is doing a bit of a tour and there's, um, they bring him a deaf man who has an impediment in his speech. So he's both deaf and, and can't talk properly. Now, that, that could, they could be actually be related as well. He can't hear his own voice, so maybe he speaks unclearly and stutters somewhat because he can't hear himself. So, okay, so this, this man who's in, in a fairly tragic kind of a situation, you know, it's, it's definitely not easy. So he takes him aside in private, away from the crowd, puts his fingers into the man's ears and touches his tongue with spittle, and looking up to heaven, he sighed. Why did he sigh? Why would Jesus sigh? Like, and why would the, even the, the, the Gospels, why would they note that detail? He sighed. So what? When Jesus sighed, like, what, what was going on? What's going on in his heart here? Jesus only sighs on, uh, he, on rare occasions he does sigh. It's mentioned elsewhere. There's a, an account in, in, in it's just one chapter later in Mark's Gospel. The Pharisees came to him to question him, to test him. They asked him for a sign from heaven. He sighed deeply and said, why does this generation ask for a sign? So Jesus signs a couple of times, sighs a couple of times in, in the Gospels. What, what's, what's going on like when, when Jesus is sighing? Okay, what do you think? I mean, I, I like thinking about these things, but what do you think? What do you think it meant? So Jesus sees this man, he's sighing. Now, obviously, he doesn't sigh because, oh, I have to heal another person. No, he's not sighing because it's inconvenient, right? So it's not that. Like, we might say, oh, gee, do I have to? Uh, no, it's, it, it's, it's not that. When he sighs, I say one chapter later, when he, when he sees the Pharisees, again, what's he sighing about? The Lord sees the heart. The Lord sees the heart. And the heart is sometimes really, really, really beautiful. And sometimes the heart is really, really, really broken. And sometimes it's, 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 it's full of pain. Or sometimes it's full of corruption. But that's what the Lord sees. When he meets a person, he sees, like when he, when he gazes on you, what he sees, what he sees is in here. And when the Pharisees came to him wanting a sign, he's like, you don't want a sign. You know, you're just looking for a reason to kill me. And he just sighs. Like, and it's a sigh that comes from deep within his heart. And in this case, he meets a man who has suffered greatly. And I think he sighs in compassion. Do you know, he sees that how often maybe, like, how was this fellow treated by his family? You know, if, if he's deaf, then working out in the fields, he can't hear the other guy's calling to him. 
He's kind of an embarrassment to the family. And then in Jewish culture as well, if you were ill, if you were, if you were sick, it was a sign that well, it, they understood it as God chastising the family, God punishing the family for some sin. So if you had leprosy, God was punishing you because you committed some sin. This, again, is Jewish understanding, not our understanding, it's not our teaching at all, but this was their understanding. So if you had a, a sick child, the neighbours, the, the whole street would have thought, ah, they must have done something wrong, God's punishing them. So he wouldn't have even have been kind of loved and protected by his own family. You know, so life would have been, life would have been hard. He would have experienced an awful lot of rejection. And so Jesus comes and, and Jesus knows his heart. And he just, he sighs in compassion, knowing what this fellow has been through. I remember when I was a young priest, uh, I, met, I met a couple and they had, I don't know, three kids, I think, um, all blonde and wee and bouncy and full of energy and they were just jumping around the place and jumping over benches and pews and everything. The family was kind of real domain at times, you know. You feel bad, you know, those kind of um, children leash things that just kind of, you know, you see them around, they're, they're a great idea. You kind of feel bad having one because like you might have the dog on the other side. <laughs> but like, I'm not saying that the same, it's just this guy's really quick. <laughs> so it was like that kind of a situation, just really, really lovely kids, lovely kids, but just tons of energy, tons of energy. And, um, and so I got talking to, uh, to the lady a little later on, the mom of the family, and, uh, and she broke down, she broke down in tears. And I was only young, I was only six months maybe, a priest. I was de definitely within my first year. Uh, and she worked on, I said, is, is everything okay? And she said, it's just, it's just, it can be so hard in the family. And I said, what's, what's wrong? And she said, I, my parents were alcoholics. And so I was, I was taken into, into a, a home um, at a very young age and I was abused there. And then like, you know, it's, you just, your heart just sinks, you know what I mean? And I completely identify like with what the Lord is saying, you know, just, you just, and then she said, and then I went, I was fostered out, I went to, I was brought into a foster family, and I was abused there. And, you know what I mean, like, it's just, you, Jean, you, think, it, you think it just can't get worse. But then she said, this kind of cycle of addiction in the family, it kind of, it, it hit me too. And so I started drinking, and then I got into, uh, a relationship with, with, with a man and lo and behold the cycle continued you know and a, a cycle of, of abuse and like just the compassion you'd have for someone I, I get this kind of image at times when I'm talking to people who are, who are very very hurt I just want to get a big duvet right I want to wrap them up in this duvet I want to give them a big mug of hot chocolate right and I just want to kind of sit there and say it'll be okay do you know what I mean you just want to protect them you just want to keep them safe you know so you can imagine like then the, the, the Lord who loves so, so much more than we ever could seeing someone who has suffered and he just sighs with compassion you know this this is how the Lord sees us you know so often we can we can misunderstand the Lord and and kind of reduce our faith to rules or thou shalt nots and we forget like that all of those important as they are the real essence of our faith the real heart of our faith is a God who is love and a God who actually in some way kind of suffers with us identifies with our suffering knows our suffering knows our hearts and wants to lift us up out of that and so he actually he actually sighs with compassion not, not, not with not with frustration, but with love. Because he looks at us, God, the Father looks at us uh, as his children, says, this, should never, this, should never, this was never my plan, this should never have happened, it should never have been this way. But I love you. I love you. And I want to lift you up out of this. And I want to bring you to myself, to heaven, and wrap you up in a duvet, and give you a celestial pint of hot chocolate. <laughs> with marshmallows <laughs> and you will not gain even an, a gram of weight <laughs> so it's miraculous because I love you and I will bring you to that place where there is no more sorrow no more pain every tear is wiped away and we will be united 
forever. That's what the book of Revelation teaches us without the duvet and hot chocolate, but that every tear will be wiped away, you know, and we'll be with him forever. That's our God. And so he sees this man suffering, and his heart understands, and he sighs with compassion. And that wasn't just this man back then. That's you and I today. So we thank the Lord for, for his love and his compassion and his understanding. We thank him for his pierced heart, opened, pierced open, cut open for love of us. And Lord, may we always respond to your love for us with our love for you. Amen.